Good morning, everyone. Rock and roll. Rock and roll. Can I get you some? Do you want more coffee? My name is uh, Stamatis Vokos. I am a professor of physics here at Seattle Pacific University, and I will be chairing session one of uh, this conference. Um, I am uh, very excited to um, be in the position to introduce to you the three speakers uh, for today. Uh, I received their CVs, and they're really impressive. Um, there was uh, one entry to one CV about uh, um, uh, a grant on intellectual humility, and I thought that that was uh, uh, an oxymoron in some circles. <laughs> and so that was a very, uh, that, that was a wonderful piece of work to be happening. And I think Jim is, uh, uh, that was on your CV, I think. Excellent. Wonderful. So um, uh, the three speakers today are uh, Jim uh, Cresswell from Booth University College, uh, Julie Yonker from um, Calvin College, and, uh, um, and Matt Van Cleve from Lansing Community College. And I will not read the uh, titles of their uh, presentations, but I will let them uh, do that themselves. And I ask us to, um, to invite them uh, one by one to the stage and to uh, warmly welcome them as they come up. Uh, Jim. Do you hear me now? Good. So uh, once again, I want to start off by saying thank you for allowing me to be here. It's an honor. It's kind of fun. You know, today I'm going to present a talk about, I've entitled, I don't know if it's such a good title, but don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, how to have a cognitive science of a religion that addresses cultural realities. You know, what we see here uh, in this picture from uh, the assassination of Briand is an expression of religious phenomena. You know, consider the irony you know, of the assassination of a surprisingly serene man by a soldier with a white cross, the latter being assisted by this monk who looks nothing short of a thug. Consider the delighted smile of the official in blue, the scream of the woman. Uh, these images invoke common religious realities. Indignation, authenticity, tragedy, virtue, hypocrisy. And for me, it's an inspiration for what I need to work on grasping if I'm going to take the religious phenomena seriously. Uh, my purpose is to skim through a draft of a paper that I've worked out that tries to move theory and CSR in a direction that can account for religious realities. Now, I need to confess I feel a little bit awkward here. As a cultural psychologist, my community is one where when someone says the word cognitivism, everyone spits. Right? <laughs> and then and <laughs> in another environment, uh, it's, uh, and then I'm speaking to an audience here uh, who may have other opinions. <laughs> and so I'm basically, I'm not too sure. What I'm trying to do is try to make cognitive psychology palpable for more culturally oriented people and maybe smuggle a little bit of culture into CSR. We'll see how it works. Okay, so I don't know if I'm going to be successful or not, but my tenure app doesn't depend on it. It's fine. Uh, so here it is. Uh, myself and Jeff Reber, uh, we point out that psychologists can run the risk of actually bypassing religious phenomena when they research it. Uh, what we're trying to get at has been described by William James in the sentiment of rationality as follows. And William James says, to religious persons of every shade of doctrine, moments come when the world as it is seems so divinely orderly and the acceptance of it by the heart so rapturously complete, ontological emotion so fills the soul that ontological speculation can no longer overlap it. This is an idea that shows us that from within, Religion involves an ostensive reality that entails the complexities that we see in this kind of painting. And I, my, my concern, or what, where my thinking has gone, is that CSR, Cognitive Science of Religion, as yet, has not really given us a way to kind of get inside these lived re realities. And I think our work is still kind of pragmatically or practically silent outside the lab. And that's what I'm trying to work out, is how can we be, have a little more pragmatic utility? And so, oh. Something happened. Hmm. 
I've lost something. Sorry, folks. All right. I had a wonderful slide that had my purpose and everything on it, and it's gone. <laughs> Technology. Sorry about that. So this is a slide that I'm going to talk about now for those of you who are deeply confused. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, CSR, I think, is appropriately cagey about its relationship to evolutionary psychology. It does, uh, however, CSR does need a convincing story about where universal architecture that enables religion comes from. Uh, we see evolutionary psychology cited fairly regularly. The work of Tubi and Cosmides comes up reasonably often. Uh, they argue that selection is the only causal process that propels a population towards uh, functional adaptations. And the supposition that I see kind of in the Tubi and Cosmides evolutionary psychology literature is that the environment, including culture, impacts human cognitive architecture over phylogenetic time. Uh, they claim that, for example, quote, supernatural interactions depend intimately on the representations of other and other regulatory elements in the head of every individual involved and therefore on the systems of computation inside each head. And so here's why I think we in CSR like evolutionary psychology, which is that they offer us a view to the development of domain-specific pro, domain processing models. So these are the processing modules that are unique for specific problems, the toolkit approach we've talked about before. They're important to CSR because domain specificity is generally taken to be the only possible means by which brain systems could select input. Natural selection is taken to generate, taken to be the thing that generates these domain-specific mechanisms. And these mechanisms form the bedrock of the modules that, that we tend to need in CSR. In the cognitive science of religion, uh, we, we suppose that the culturally variant expressions of religion exist because they capitalize on universal cognitive architecture that's generated via evolution. So the implication is that CSR, this is general trends of course, it's a broad area with diversity, but generally we see that it tends to inherit a few things from evolutionary psychology. It inherits from evolutionary psychology the idea that what really matters is the Pleistocene environment, and this is what matters most for development of cognition. Uh, the immediate situation seems to play a very low role in the constitution of cognition, other than standing as a reserve for input conditions. So the culturally specific narratives and languages are usually not a focus. And so in my cheeky parlance, uh, the baby, the immediate role of culture, has been thrown out with the bathwater as we've stripped away cultural specificity to discover cognitive architecture. I mean, so what's the problem? Uh, this picture is an expression of religious phenomena in a holistic sense. And I feel like we lose the whole when we treat it as the sum of modules. We lose how religion itself is lived and experienced from within. The exact kinds of things that constitute religious phenomena, like the struggle with good and evil or irony of uh, evil masquerading as good, are really not grasped when we sidestep the cultural narratives and meanings that people in, in life live. So to understand this religious expression, I think we need to take a little more seriously the ontogenetic role of culture and language and what it means. So I propose that the realities that we experience as given come from our participation in communities in sociolinguistic practices. Uh, my own work uh, outside of the CSR has involved language and language shaping our phenomenological experience of the body, or how we experience the world through the body. In particular, I've been working on how a religious community involves sociolinguistic practices that shape the world insofar as we can phenomenologically experience it. So consider why this painting would be provocative or have meaning. I took this, this is a picture of this painting from the Louvre. I took a picture of it there. Um, funny story sometime about me setting off the alarm, but we'll move on. Um, you know, why would we hang it in the Louvre? Because it means something to a heck of a lot of people. And there's something there that has power and force for us. Why would it be provocative or why would it mean anything to us? Well, maybe many people within the Protestant tradition have participated in a community that's been telling post-enlightenment stories about Catholic hypocrisy for a while. Could be. I thought that was funnier than it came off, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it has involved a way of talking about self as an individual or maybe the American Protestant struggle against outside pressures to be authentic in one's expression of faith. These are the kinds of realities that shape what we experience as given. 
So my supposition, and that's really all it is, is that treating culture and cognition as ontogenetic into, ontogenetically interdependent can help us get towards this holistic meaning. And this is a position that rests on giving culture the roles beyond being mere stimulus or some sort of maintenance role. For culture to shape what we experience as real, I think we really need it to be integrated with our cognition. And so I'll give an example from Takamasuda's work. You know, he's shown, for example, that perceptual capacities are shaped by the communities in which one participates. If you participate in a community where you tell stories and have narratives and language about taking responsibility for others, being part of a community, being aware of the world around you, what happens is your eyeballs can't focus. Your eyeballs are all over a vista, right? You take into account a wide range. As opposed to someone like me who's been told uh, stories about achievement, individual development. I see a narrow field and there's far less eye movement. This is a real simplistic example that illustrates the interdependence between culture and cognition and a really basic perceptual cap, uh, capacity like apprehending vistas. I guess what I'm saying is how much more would culture and cognition be integrated in the case of higher order mental functions like religious phenomena? So the good news is CSR is not necessarily committed to a culturally isolated concept of cognition because I see this kind of schismatic split in the literature. And it doesn't seem to be connected to the, the, the isolated concept of cognition we see from evolutionary psychology of the tubing cosmetes sort. Some theorists note that the shaping effects of, ev uh, of evolved psychological mechanisms are only some, quote, of the factors influencing religious innovation and transmission. This comes from Cohen et al in 2008. Others note that, quote, unlike social lives of non-human primates, human social life is thoroughly cultural. There need not have been anything in the ancestral module that preclude the possibility of culturally enhanced or constructed cues. And most recently, of course, uh, Bob McCauley has notes that cognition, he says, clearly is embedded and embodied while describing how cognitive accomplishments are not confined to what necessarily just happens inside people's heads. And I guess the problem what's kind of inspired me to kind of struggle with this for the last two and a half years is that it doesn't seem like people are really developing these ideas. Even though there's a grain and, and some potential there, I don't really see the development of it. And I wonder if sometimes these kind of embedded, embodied cognition ideas are read like a byline, point to something that I think we know in CSR we should deal with, but we're just not too sure how or what to do. Uh, I propose that it's possible to shift CSR in a direction that really enables a win-win because we can articulate a model of cognition that includes a meaningful ontogenetic role of culture if we just kind of move outside of the old school symbolic AI mode. So I propose that the, the theoretical work to be done is to rework our understanding of evolutionary psychology so we can kind of get outside of kind of our, ah, this is a bit strong, but kind of our dependence on domain-specific processing mechanisms. So. We'll see how that goes. Okay. So the inactivist approach to cognition, I think, is what offers us something here. And I'd like to see inactivism get picked up in CSR literature. It starts from the same claim as Macaulay, which is a, a cognition in, is embodied and embedded. From an inactive standpoint, cognition belongs to the whole sensory motor activity of the body. Uh, the trend in CSR is to generally think of cognition as embodied in terms of the architecture of the brain and mapping modules. Uh, I'm trying to argue that we need to think of cognition as something that involves our whole body. It would be understood as something emergent in circular causality of continuous sensory motor interactions involving brain, body, and most importantly, others, other bodies. So uh, consider how Tom, a uh, theory of mind, is generally treated as a mechanism that looks like the representation of others' mental states. So instead of representing the content of others' minds in their heads, the ontogenetic development of what looks like Tom could be actually a gradual falling into synchronicity with others. So people such as Reddy, uh, R-E-D-D-Y, -E point out the development of cognition such as things like laughter. As anyone, I always talk, before I came down, I, my family was watching a show called Here Comes Honey Boo Boo. <laughs> uh, I know, shake your, it hurt me too, Adam, thank you. Um, but, Someone on the show farted. And then my son, who's nine, all humor is scatological for nine-year-old boys, started laughing. And my wife started laughing. And I didn't find this funny, but I couldn't stop laughing. And suddenly we're laughing. As everyone had this moment of being caught up in the laughter of a community, right, against yourself, or to tears, or something to that effect. Five minutes, shoot, okay. Um, 
you know, how did you get to this place where you're caught up in this dynamic rhythm? And how do you know that laughter is in someone else's mind? Well, maybe it's not it's in someone else's mind, it's among us. Young children practice laughing and we see them look at others while laughing away that's too loud or ill-timed. You see kids kind of mess up and parents make fun of them. Uh, gradually, they become aligned with others as they develop. And this development is falling into synchronicity with adults, which means this dynamic cultivation of a synchronous enactment of what is really funny. So a child does not have the this is funny mechanism, and I know what's in your head, but developmentally cultivated sensory motor synchronicity with others. So a child knows the other finds something funny because the child eventually participates in it bodily. Developing cognition, I would argue, is falling into synchronicity with the cultural realities embodied by the stories people tell ourselves, and we talk to ourselves about them. Consequentially, perceptual, perception consists in perceptually guided action and cognitive structures emerge from recurrent sensory motor patterns that enable actions to be perceptually guided. Rather than claiming people have domain-specific programs about a supernatural being, they could be seen to engage a supernatural being that is part of a cultural reality that we bodily live with others in our talk about it. An implication of the claim is that we can look at this painting and we can apprehend how our perceptions of it is bound to the languages and narratives that we participate in. This approach gets us to the richness of religious phenomena by making room for a complex web of history that inspires our responses to the painting. It allows us also to retain a role of the body, which I think is probably important for us. It would pro also, blah, blah, blah. that's all folks. <laughs> it also enables a way to rethink evolution. What I'm proposing is kind of re-theorizing adaptation, how we think about it in the CSR. Adaptation starts with a person attuning to cultural realities, which means that what happens in dynamic relationships with others. See, I can be said to have adapted once I satisfactorily en enact the normativity of my community. I speak and live the Christian jargon in the right way. And everyone goes, ah, you're authentic. I've adapted. Adaptation, of course, is closely linked to the idea of reproduction. So both adaptation and reproduction consist in one unity organizing another unity of the same class to have the same organization. Children adapt to the realities in which they participate, and such realities are historically situated. Adapting is this aligning with caregivers, with what caregivers have lived, and so amounts to a generational reproduction. Laughter, for example, would be a really robust system that we've had for a long time. Perhaps religious indignation in light of this painting becomes a fairly robust system that, for more recent times. So what about phylogenetic change? Ontogenetic change occurs when humans uh, when a human's sensory and motor attunement becomes aligned with others, and this can change over one's lifetime. Phylogenetic change involves a progressive change that amounts to what they call natural or a drift. Change emerges in the internal dynamics of a person through interdependent relationships with others, and so change over phylogenetic time is not so different. Gradual coordinated change and self-organization is bound to others, and this can, in turn, lead to gradual changes in a population. So while I'm going a little too quickly here, the main idea is, in short, is that we have to understand that cognitive universals, so we have a way to understand cognitive universals that are of interest to the CSR by seeing them as robust dynamic systems that are regularly reproduced interpersonally and culturally in concert with kind of the body. The difference is that we have a paradigm that doesn't really exclude the meaningful role of culture. So where do we want to go? I mean, my own work, I'm trying to take a pretty f strong form of cultural psychology here. I've tried to make a case for a different form of theorizing in CSR that can open us up to religious phenomena instead of cutting us off from it. So the kinds of directions that I propose would be include would be a strong form of cultural psychology. So future work looking at narrative sociolinguistic patterns as they're embodied in the minutiae of life. I started doing work with a student looking at kind of micro interactions between parents and their children, their infants, and how kids are talk, talked to and, and fall into rhythms with their parents. So we can kind of moral development, pre, what we call proto language moral development. Uh, it would also mean doing a lot more work that's more ecologically embedded and getting away from the lab, which is messy and difficult, but maybe we should go there. And there's a, a side of me where I think maybe it'd be kind of fun to just go through a whole bunch of CSR and reinterpret it along an activist par paradigm and see what happens. So anyway, I really appreciate the fact that you've let me philosophize here. And I'll conclude so Julie can come talk. Thank you.
have a couple of uh, minutes for questions. <laughs> uh, actually, a lot of things. Uh, the uh, first comment is, is that it seems to me that this is exactly the future of study about ritual. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, yeah. That public ritual is very much about getting synchronicity in people's bodily states yeah. and producing cognitive and emotional effects as a result. Uh, so I'm, I'm utterly sympathetic. I mean, I don't know uh, if you know about Emma Collins and stuff, yeah. research on the, the rowing teams at, uh, at Oxford. Yeah. Um, uh, but, you know, likewise with regard to the uh, sort of getting stuff out of the lab, I mean, you know, this, this Argus group, uh, you know, they've got this whole station now in Mauritius studying mm -hmm. these guys doing these firewalking rituals uh, and, and figuring out ways to monitor them in the midst of the rituals, yeah. I mean, it's uh, so. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think you know, I think it's a big, huge project, and it's just lots of people have to do lots of things. But I, the question is, that's a little. Speech. Oh, there's a question. There is a question. I was going to submit one myself. The question, that, <laughs> the question is right at the end. You put in something about reinterpreting previous research. You had to have had something in mind. So why don't you tell us about it? Actually, no, no. I was just trying to be nice. <laughs> No, what, I, what, I, what I've often thought about, when I read, for example, like uh, Justin's work or Boyer, or I read this, they, there's a, the, you keep seeing this kind of toolkit idea coming up. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to go, go back to that work and say, well, look at your results. Uh, my suspicion is that those results are couched in a particular, particular type of theoretical understanding that have shaped how we interpreted them. And I'm wondering if we take an inactivist paradigm, go back to some, some of the stuff and say, you know, the other results consistent with another theory. Uh, start from there. Uh, that's what I'm kind of pondering. Uh, yeah, Myron. Thank you. So, um, does inactivism reject the notion of uh, universal, cross culturally recurrent domain specific <coughs> modules? Or does it want to supplement that understanding with a different set of questions? Yeah, what it does is actually pull apart the thing that you're talking about. So they, they have no problem with universal universals, right? Uh, but they don't want to essentialize them and they want to keep them dynamic systems. So I talk about laughter being a robust system. I mean, that's a pretty robust human dynamic system. That's, but what they want to get away from is this idea of domain specificity and this kind of module of input-output conditions uh, and say, well, you know, it's, it's, cognition is actually something that is always kind of tied into the other, whatever the other is, in a really meaningful way, not in terms of an input stimulus that kicks a mechanism into gear. So they would split apart what you're asking and say, first part, universals, yeah. Second part, domain specific, eh, not so much. Now, the problem I think that we come to then is that inactivism is, is embodied cognition stuff is a broad field of its own right, where you have some people on uh, one side, which I see are pretty, I mean, I don't really see how they're any different from what's been going on uh, from, since the 1960s. Then you have the really radical people who I'm kind of throwing myself in with, like Thompson, who's really kind of radical against representationalism and all sorts of stuff like that, right? So when you say, what does an activism believe? Well, which an activist? <laughs> That's I guess I just you know understood the standard model uh, as being uh, in CSR as being not you know completely a, a nativist theory of cognition, but recognizing the role that, that culture does play, in, and that there are certain kind of cultural universals, but also contingencies too. And, and uh, uh, Macaulay last night used the language of tuning by culture, and, and I'm just trying to figure out. So, is um, where does inactivism fit kind of on that? Yeah. Where I think of that, I think an activism is something which has a lot of potential for us because I think CSR is already has this kind of ambivalence built into it, right? I mean, the literature seems to be ambivalent. Uh, and so on the one hand, we see, yeah, we want to have this. And it's a kind of a byline. You see, like in Sperber's work, I read it quite a bit, and Sperber always has this kind of, oh, yeah, it's more. Than, than, and, but then, but then goes, goes back to talking about domain-specific processing modules. And so you see this kind of, even in the literature, there's this kind of back and forth in the, in the books. And so but the place, I think, for an activism is to kind of give us somewhere to go um, and a vision. And maybe other people are already doing it. So good on them. I mean, I can go back to teaching. <laughs> Let us thank you, Jim, again.
talking about intelligences and religiosity um, and a, a project where we're going to be looking at intelligences a, a bit more um, broadly. What am I doing? Doesn't seem to like that. Did I break something? There we go. Okay. Well, maybe we'll just have to work off of this then. Um, so I'm going to be presenting this morning uh, two studies. The first one looking at emotional intelligence with uh, respect to perspective taking. So again, uh, a bit of semantics that we've been uh, uh, working with a, a bit during this conference is um, theory of mind versus perspective taking. Again, your perspective on how you look at that. Um, looking at this as a um, cross-sectional study across adulthood looking at how uh, religious experiences as well as executive functioning, which would be the more um, sort of general intelligence would factor in, as well as then age and personality. And then my second study is um, to sort of uh, maybe fine tune, so to speak, uh, the, the uh, microscope and look again at this perspective taking in general intelligence, but in a more um, controlled environment and looking at the influences of uh, religiosity. So basically when I'm talking about uh, perspective taking, We've seen a link between emotional intelligence and perspective staking. Previous research has also shown um, that there's this association between emotional intelligence and um, empathy. But we also see with respect to perspective taking that there are some declines that happen throughout um, development. So older adults are not quite as able to take the perspective of other individuals as well as um, younger individuals. We've already talked about the fact that children need to learn that. Um, so we sort of see a a, a little bit of a, of a U-shaped curve there. Um, but some studies have on the other side, though, said that actually perhaps theory of mind does improve with age. And so looking at perspective taking and the influence then of religiosity, uh, previous research has shown that there is uh, perspective taking now again semantically looking at it again a little bit more broadly with respect to empathy that there have been relationships shown there um, more religious adolescents demonstrate uh, more empathy which I think m most of us would agree is, is a very good thing and then um, because I am looking at sort of this age related issues with respect to uh, perspective taking and religiosity we know that spirituality and religiosity do increase um, during later adulthood. So my research questions are, are people who score higher on religiosity and spirituality scales better able to take the perspective of others? So thinking a little bit about sort of that biblical mandate, um, you know, what should we, you know, do unto others as, as we would have them uh, do unto us sort of thing. Um, the religiosity and spirituality, can that be protective? If, if people are able to do that better, could that be protective against age-related declines in perspective taking. So the religiosity measures that I used, um, one was the Dural, the Duke uh, religiosity scale. And basically, you can see some of the prompts up there. But basically, what it's looking at is it's sort of a combination of all ports, um, intrinsic and extrinsic, and sort of combining them um, into two um, uh, items to be able to get this much shorter scale. And then the spiritual well-being um, is again looking a little bit and, and, and being a bit more uh, self-focused in that, but how am I feeling with respect to uh, my spirituality and my relationship um, with God? And then I sort of included this um, other additional measure is uh, the golden rule. And do you know what the golden rule is? Um, and it, it write down the golden rule. And then my research assistants would then, after it appears that people had written something, they would actually state what it was. And then ask them, how much do you live your life by the golden rule? And this is obviously very cute, Berenstein Bears, but the golden rule or some variant of it are found in many different um, religions. And so it's not just in Christianity, thank you. And so one of the things was I was wanting to find out, is this actually a religious in sort of injunctive or is this actually a perspective taking? And so what I did was I looked at, there's a, dur a prompt with the Durrell, meaning um, I, how much do you agree or disagree with this statement? I tried to carry over my religion into other parts of my life and I did not find a relationship between that particular prompt and their uh, scores on the golden rule um, question. So it seems like it's not so much religion as maybe a bit of a perspective taking. 
So again, just to sort of go through rather quickly with the different um, scales, we got um, fairly decent reliability, um, that golden rule, even though the reliability on that particular scale was 0.61, that's actually not out of the ballpark with respect to a novel uh, measure. So we feel pretty comfortable with that. So our perspective taking tasks, we actually have, have a few of them. Um, the first one is the eyes task put forth by um, Simon Baron Cohen a lot with his work on autism which we again discussed a little bit uh, last night that individuals who suffer from uh, autism are not able to take the perspective of others quite as well. Um, do we want to have people say which emotion is being expressed here? Panicked. Yes, exactly. This person is panicked. Good job. Okay, um, another one also um, in re uh, with respect to Simon Baron Cohen is what's called these faux pas tasks. So um, individuals were read and could follow along uh, little paragraphs. So this one is an example. Jill had just moved into her new apartment. Jill went shopping and bought some new curtains for her bedroom. When she had just finished decorating the apartment, her best friend Lisa came over. Jill gave her a tour of the apartment and asked, how do you like my bedroom. Those curtains are horrible, Lisa said. I hope you're going to get some new ones. And then the question is, did somebody say something that they shouldn't have said? Okay, so this is obviously a faux pas, right? We should not have said that. And there were control tasks as well. And then the last measure was actually a, a novel measure that I wanted to take and, and sort of grew out of the fact that um, oftentimes when uh, you're showing somebody something um, and sort of demonstrating to them what it is, sometimes you don't turn it for them to see it from their perspective. And, and this sort of uh, related to my mother-in-law who has, <laughs> sorry, I'm dissing my mother-in-law. She has a hard time taking the perspective of other people. Uh, <laughs> she really does. <laughs> and I'm not just saying that because she's a mother-in-law. Uh, <laughs> So she'll she'll like she'll have a picture and and she'll show me you know we went to you know Hungary and we just saw this cathedral and so I'm standing here and she's standing here and she does not turn the picture for me to see the cathedral I kind of have to do one of these numbers and so this was an object rotation we had a couple um, pictures that that were presented to the individual from their perspective we asked them what they could see they should say a hand and a lion and then the experimenter would say oh. I could see that it's a hand. I can't see the lion. Can you point it out to me? And so we asked then people to, um, to see how much did they rotate and show it from their perspective, or did they keep it at their own perspective? So we had a scale um, to measure that as well. And then we used uh, Giuseppe's, um, the, those uh, traditional like fruit and faces um, and things like that as well. We also wanted to have a couple cognitive control tasks um, with respect to that object rotation, because that is a bit of a visual space sort of activity. Um, we gave them the bottles task, um, bottles at various and assorted angles. Did they realize that to show the water level that this is the correct one? Okay, just in case you were wondering. I know you were so confused on that. Uh, but trust me, we, we have seen those are quite um, uh, typical uh, ways of responding. And then um, a measure of executive functioning, uh, the digit uh, symbol task, how quickly uh, they've got 90 seconds, they've got a row of numbers and they need to put in those uh, symbols symbols underneath and how quickly can they do that. Um, so just a little bit about our participants. We, um, of course, had a nice emerging adult population. We both used um, half of those students came from Calvin College. The other half of the students came from uh, the local community college because we wanted to have some non-religious folks as well. Um, the middle-aged adults, again, uh, half from um, uh, the campus at, at Calvin College, faculty or staff, mostly staff, and then the other half were from staff from the community college as well. And then older adults came from a uh, retirement community uh, community that was a public housing retirement community. Um, so you can see again their, um, the, the distribution and their scores on there and again we see obvious differences with um, the Durrell, with well-being, um, and with the total perspective taking uh, score as well. So when we look at just strict correlations, we can see um, with respect to the religiosity measures as one would expect. Um, overall, the golden rule actually did uh, correlate with the Durrell. Um, spiritual well-being highly correlated. Openness, not quite so much. Um, again, age as we would expect. Spiritual well-being um, with the golden rule and openness, again, the negative perspective. Um, and so we, with the total perspective taking, we sort of looked at the individual items, but then I did make um, a z-score and made a, a composite variable as well of those three particular um, uh, 
aspects of that. And so then what I did was a, a hierarchical multiple regression analysis looking at perspective taking, step one, including the controls of age, gender, and then those um, intelligences um, included in that. The second one looking at personality. And then the final measure was adding the spiritual well-being in there. And so you can see that we got um, pretty good um, ability to sort of predict uh, based on those sort of final measures. So this, this sort of study ended up with the perspective taking. Uh, the biggest predictors uh, were female. Uh, the, the female gender was a bigger predictor. Um, Laird is saying, yes, I can get that. Um, golden rule, spiritual well-being was in a negative direction. And um, openness was another one with respect to perspective taking. Um, so basically, our conclusions then is that increased religiosity really didn't protect against um, declines in perspective taking. So that wasn't a protective measure, which is, would have been nice, but uh, we unfortunately did not find that. Um, the golden rules correlated a little bit better as a perspective taking task rather than a religious task. And then again, uh, females, golden rule, openness, positively correlated, spiritual well-being, negatively correlated. And when I presented this to the group um, the last time that we had met, um, it was brought to our attention that perhaps because the spiritual well-being is so focused on myself and my relationship with God that it's a little bit more self-focused than other focused and that's probably why we see that negative direction there. Um, so again, individuals who are more religious are actually not really much better able to take um, the perspective of others, which again was a little bit sad um, to find that, but that's what we ended up with. But then I wanted to sort of refine this a little bit and look a little bit more clearly and see if we could control things. Um, so in study two, it was sort of, in addition to wanting to control things a little bit, there was an article that came out about the same time that sort of got my gander up a little bit. Um, Bright minds and, and dark attitudes, lower cognitive ability predicts greater prejudice through right-wing um, ideology. And I thought, well, this really, this, this is not helpful. Um, and so I wanted to see then, could I um, you know, design the study with a little bit more of, of this um, in, in effect. So basically what I decided then to do with my researchers question is what if we did this perspective taking task at a religiously affiliated college, so again Calvin College, um, then we controlled for age, we controlled for education, we controlled for sort of a baseline religiosity. Calvin College you do not have to be Christian in order to um, attend but we obviously do have a significant proportion. And so then would we also find no relationship between between religiosity and perspective taking, but also I wanted to include some measures of religious prejudice. So my additional measures were looking at religious emphasis in upbringing, because obviously that's important as we've got emerging adults, how did their upbringing, that's so very close to their time period in college. And then my sort of prejudice scales that also have religiosity components to them was fundamentalism, right-wing authoritarianism, and then I also wanted to look at questing, and did that have an effect as well? well. So these were the tasks and um, this was sort of basically the order that we presented them. So again, we included the golden rule and the eyes task and the personality, the Durrell. Um, our intelligence tasks that we used in this respect because we knew that we sort of already had a high level of intelligence so we wanted to use a more sensitive measure and this would be Raven's uh, progressive matrices. So you can see an example of, of that task that people were to uh, complete. Religious emphasis, fundamentalism, right-wing authoritarian and questing. And the reason why we had them in this particular order is that we knew we were working at a Christian college and so we knew there would be some social desirability with how they responded and that they would, okay, I need to answer in a Christian way because I'm at a Christian college. And so we wanted to put a cognitive load on them um, because usually if you're kind of loaded, you're just like, ah, oh, I can't handle this. And they answer what really is in their heart more than what they think you want to give them. And so that's why this uh, Raven's Matrices is actually a 20 minutes of doing these sorts of things. So we've kind of loaded them pretty cognitively. And then we asked them to answer these sorts of questions. Um, so we feel that they were relatively truthful in their responses. Um, again, just a little bit about the participants that we had in that. Um, again, you can see the, the um, correlations. We did not see any correlations.
interactions with the intelligence. So um, that I thought in and of itself was quite interesting because again, we have a little bit of a spread. Um, but with the perspective taking, it's looking like the right wing authoritarianism is sort of jumping out um, a bit more uh, significantly. A lot of stuff on my regression here. Sorry, this ended up being a, a, a really big um, uh, table here, but I sort of entered them all in and steps looking again a bit more at controls in step one, step two adding the personality elements, and then in step three adding in the more religious elements. So let me just give you the, the slide where things conclude so it's a little bit cleaner. Um, after we controlled for age, education, uh, religiosity, again perspective taking was again predicted by the female gender and negatively predicted by right wing authoritarianism. That's where that sort of popped out. Um, again, there was a relationship between emotional intelligence and prejudice, but not necessarily um, the general intelligence. Um, and then with respect to religiosity, the emphasis with their upbringing positively related to um, the uh, related to the religiosity fundamentalism, right-wing authoritarianism, um, as well as extroversion personality traits, but negatively related to questing as one might imagine. And then again, one might also imagine the Duke religiosity scale positive related to religious emphasis, uh, right-wing authoritarianism, uh, fundamentalism, extroversion, but negatively related to uh, questing with respect to all of that. And these are the students that helped with my research. So thank you. Good. Yeah. Questions? I have a couple of questions of clarification before I actually get to the Oh, before you actually get to the real question. Yeah, okay. just to make sure. I'm yep, saying. yep. So when you asked them about the golden rule, it looked like you said, do you know what it is? And then mm -hmm. do you practice it? If they didn't know it, did you first tell them what it right, was? Right, that's what we did. We first asked them, then we gave them a chance to write it, because we actually wanted to know, did they actually know it? And so then the researcher would wait a little bit to, <coughs> to wait till they had finished writing, and then they would say it. Okay, the experimenter would actually say it. Um, I know you've just written the golden rule, but here's what it is. Now tell me how much you live your life by it. Okay. And yeah. then for the rotation, uh -huh. it said you told them that I can't really see it and then had them turn it. Mm -hmm. Did you score whether people originally turned it for you or you always asked them to turn it for you? Well, first they were presented and they were told, and, and again, we're sitting across the table, so we just hand you this picture. And you say to them, what do you see? And they should have said a hand and a lion. And then the experimenter would say, oh, I can't see the lion. Can you show it to me? So that was the impetus to have them turn and get at their perspective. So I'm wondering um, if that is potentially part of the problem with your measure on that, because that wouldn't really show a person's sort of self-generated response to show it to you and turn mm -hmm. to take your perspective. You've actually asked them to do it, and you're just measuring the level of rotation. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm wondering if the operational definition of perspective taking maybe needs to be really hammered in, because point of view is being used literally and figuratively. Mm -hmm. you're, so you're asking, like, can another person take a person's point of view? But mm -hmm. what I think you're <coughs> wanting to know is can they empathize? with them. Mm -hmm. And even in that question, um, the little scenario with did that person do something wrong? Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how it would have changed if you if you asked about the perspective of the person whose feelings were being hurt. Like how did the, the the person who was just criticized feel or something? Well actually actually those are some of the questions as well. Okay. Um, according to Simon Baron Cohen, I basically got his all his tasks that he's used. And there's a whole series of questions. So the first one is, did something say something wrong that they shouldn't? And, and there are some questions. How do you think Lisa feels? How do you think Sarah feels? So there are some of those responses in there as well. So I'm just wondering I, if maybe you're not finding that correlation, maybe because it's not exactly tapping into your measures aren't maybe Tapping, you think tapping in more into what, what I think that we're looking yeah. at? OK. Like you, the construct isn't being operationally defined OK. Yeah, it, it, it is. No, I know. And it's true because you, you end up with empathy, perspective taking, and theory of mind kind of all get jumbled together. And oftentimes, some of the articles you read, they're using all three terminologies right. for the same thing. And I'm like, OK, which one are you really working on here? Right. So you're right. It seems to be something in the field that needs to be perhaps more finely tuned. Yeah, good point. Yeah. 
I have a quick question. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, so uh, if I were to connect to the two talks that we mm -hmm. heard, um, if one takes uh, embodied cognition perspective, then there is a theoretical framework through which one can actually um, connect to the literal um, interpretation of mm -hmm. perspective taking a point of view mm -hmm. uh, to the uh, metaphorical one. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm a physicist, and so right. I do not know very much about this. Sure. So, would you um, would you expand a little bit on on the theoretical warrant for exactly that uh, move of uh, actually asking? making inferences about an uh, individual's ability to take somebody else's metaphorical perspective or perspective metaphorically okay. uh, from the actual literal, um, uh, can they actually interpret, can they identify a need mm -hmm. for the other person and therefore physically rotate something mm -hmm. or uh, uh, do they have the cognitive ability to mm -hmm. do these rotations? Okay. I, I think I understand the question that you're asking, but I, I may or may not quite quite get there. And if others I know would, might have some perspective as well. Um, I think part of this is, is looking at this from a developmental standpoint that we heard Bob talk about a bit yesterday. And it's one of those things that, that children have to be able to learn. Since we are social creatures and God created us as such, we have to be able to understand the other person's perspective because that allows us to be able to better communicate and be in relationship. Um, with others. So that's a, a bit about that um, theoretical perspective, but then also just thinking about, you know, what is religious, what is the impact of religion on this? Can this help people be able to better take people, others' perspective, because the golden rule as an impetus, um, you know, the sort of what would Jesus do movement from many years ago um, as well. And then how, as we train up our children, sort of thinking about, well, how did David feel when he killed Goliath? And, you know, things like that, um, that, that where one would lead one, someone to believe that perhaps people who are raised in more of this context would be better able to do that than others. Right. What I was um, actually trying to get at sure. is. Um, research suggests that there is a negative correlation between um, uh, gender mm -hmm. and the ability to um, to rotate things facially. Right, right, right. And so, on the other hand, uh, you showed us that there is a positive correlation between female gender. Right. And, and, um, right. No, I know, and I'm I'm I actually did research in my doctoral work on visual spatial tasks. Right. Um, so. I actually didn't, that was part of the composite. I actually didn't pull out that visual rotational task, um, you know, as, I mean, I did look at it separately, but um, you're right, there is a gender difference with respect to that. But I think the reason why gender popped up so much more sig significantly in my composite is because the empathy task, the, the eyes task, women tend to do much better on that. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, you're very welcome. The savage interrupted him, but isn't it natural to feel that there's no God? You might as well ask if it's natural to do up one's trousers with zippers, said the controller sarcastically. You remind me of another one of those old fellows called Bradley. He defined philosophy as the finding of one bad reason for what one believes by instinct. As if one believed anything by instinct. One believes because one has been conditioned to believe them. Finding bad reasons for what one believes for other bad reasons, that's philosophy. People believe in God because they've been conditioned to believe in God. From the perspective of the cognitive science of religion, CSR, Mustafa Mond was wrong. That certain kinds of religious beliefs and practices are natural, instinctual if you like, is a claim that ties together an otherwise diverse group of theorists within CSR. I refer to this claim as the naturalness thesis. And by natural here, I mean what Robert Macaulay calls maturational naturalist. A maturationally natural belief or skill is one that all normally developing members of the species will uh, end up acquiring once they've reached a certain typically young age. This is where this acquisition does not depend on any special instruction or cultural artifacts. Maturationally natural beliefs can be explicitly held, i.e., ones to which we would readily assent 
or implicitly held, i.e., ones to which we are susceptible even in spite of what we explicitly endorse. According to CSR, we are all, in virtue of our humanness, susceptible to religious thinking, regardless of whether or not we explicitly subscribe to it. Maturationally natural beliefs, in turn, are thought to be rooted in our evolutionarily acquired, uh, consciously inaccessible cognitive mechanisms, which incline us to adopt certain religious beliefs by influencing what beliefs are formed. Um, <clears throat> Numerous different cognitive mechanisms and propensities have been discovered and posited, including propensity to seek teleological explanations of natural objects, a propensity to see natural events, especially highly salient ones, as having agential explanations, a hyperactive agent detection device, a theory of mind that attributes thoughts, desires, and perspectives to unseen agents and reasons about them in their absence, and a tendency to better remember minimally counterintuitive concepts. A common picture within CSR posits at least two different types of representational content. That which derives from the various cognitive tools uh, and that of the explicitly endorsed beliefs. The central idea, the key idea central to the naturalist thesis and widespread among CSR theorists is that the explicit beliefs that are more compatible with the contents um, associated with the cognitive tools will be the beliefs that are more likely to be explicitly endorsed. Actually, <clears throat> and thus transmitted from person to person, generation to generation. Since the cognitive dispositions underwritten by these cognitive tools are maturationally natural, the religious beliefs influenced by them are natural too. In the following, I will refer to the representational content associated with the cognitive tools as intuitive content, and, I, and that associated with the explicitly endorsed beliefs as explicit content. I intend this distinction to be as theoretically neutral as possible. In particular, it's supposed to leave open whether intuitive content is propositional, non-propositional, language-like or image-like, conscious or unconscious, reducible or irreducible to brain states. These are pre precisely the kinds of issues on which there can be theoretical disagreement. However, I will make the, I think, plausible assumption that the representational content of the explicitly endorsed beliefs is propositional. By calling this content propositional, I mean that they can be true or false, it is, can be true or false, justified, unjustified, stand in certain kinds of logical relationships to each other, are restricted in the kinds, uh, or sorry, are unrestricted in the kinds of content that can be represented and are typically easily expressible in natural language. All right. Consider now some recent statements from CSR theorists about the relationship between intuitive contents and the contents of explicitly endorsed beliefs. Justin Barrett, uh, when a reflective belief ni nicely matches what our non-conscious mental tools tell us through uh, non-reflective beliefs, the reflective beliefs just seem uh, more reasonable. In the absence of salient, relevant, uh, consciously accessible reasons not to do so, reflective beliefs are simply read off of non-reflective beliefs. Explicit propositions will be more likely to feel right when they converge with implicitly held non-reflective beliefs. Pascal Boyer. What makes us assent to general statements such as children are undeveloped versions of adults is not that we readily perform a general assessment of the evidence, but rather that various mental systems out of sight, as it were, produce intuitions compatible with that general statement. The italicized phrases here are what I'm focusing on. The intuitive plausibility of an idea becomes greater as more and more different systems produce intuitions compatible with that general interpretation. Uh, Bering says, uh, young children are best envisioned as being naturally prepared to endo endorse the concept of an afterlife because it matches their own intuitions about the continuity of mind after death. Bob McCauley says, religious representations, resonances with our naturally nat natural cognitive systems pronouncements about the world are what make them so believable. Elsewhere, religion in this sense employs ideas and forms of thought that are rooted in appealing to the, or sorry, that are naturally appealing to the human mind because they are rooted in maturationally natural cognitive dispositions and the kinds of knowledge they support, which are available to most children by the time they reach school age. <clears throat> All of the italicized phrases uh, are highly metaphorical, which is not a problem as long as one recognizes them as such. But the question that needs to be asked, however, is what is the precise relationship between intuitive and explicit representational contents? And I'm going to call this the interface question. Answering the interface question requires that we understand more precisely the nature of the relata and the relationship. 
Sorting these things out is important since there can be different ways of conceptualizing the relata and the, their relationships and these different ways of conceiving them may take on importantly different theoretical commitments. These different theoretical commitments may raise set, different sets of epistemological concerns and may be more or less compatible with different versions of Christianity. Hopefully there are enough hedges there in that. <clears throat> How might we answer the interface question and give more guts to the highly abstract metaphorical language? Well, explicit content is variously said to match, to not violate, to be compatible with, to be rooted in, to resonant, uh, be resonant with, converge with, jibe with, and read off of intuitive content. The first way of conceiving of this relationship between intuitive and uh, explicit content um, is in terms of language like vehicles, syntactically structured representational vehicles that can instantiate, instantiate logical relationships in virtue of their syntactic form. If both the intuitive and explicit contents consisted of such syntactically structured vehicles, then we could flesh out the various metaphors of compatibility, support, and violation in a more precise way. Um, the idea would be that explicit and intuitive contents share the same language, a language of thought, this idea that there must be a language of thought was first championed by Jerry Fodor and has been uh, an influential position strenuously argued by Fodor along with Granny and Ante ever since. I call this view the nature uh, of the nature of the intuitive representational content the classical view. Whereas the classical view takes intuitive content to be propositional, one could also claim that intuitive content is non-propositional. In the philosophy of cognitive science, a theoretical viewpoint according to which intuitive content is non-propositional is known as connectionism. We can think of the non-propositional representation that connectionism posits as akin to perceptual or imagistic representa representations or the representations involved in certain kinds of know-how abilities such as knowing how to swim or ride a bicycle. For simplicity, this is a much shorter version of the paper I wrote. I propose to think about the difference between propositional and non-propositional content as roughly that of images versus sentences. If intuitive representational content is in understood as imagistic and analog in character, then the problem arises. How can imagistic content support or be compatible with the propositional contents of explicitly endorsed beliefs? After all, pictures and sentences seem to represent in incommensurable ways. It is sometimes said that a picture is worth a thousand words, but this is probably to understate it. A thousand words could never capture what a picture represents, and the picture, however detailed, could never represent a simple proposition like it is not raining. Thus, the basic problem that the connectionist view encounters is the incommensurability between image-like and sentence-like representations. Two different ways of responding to this problem would produce two different versions of the connectionist view. On the one hand, one might try to overcome the incommensurability, for example, show how explicit propositional contents can be derived from or built out of non-propositional contents. This attempt to, the attempt to do so, I think, is analogous to the classical empiricist project of trying to show how concepts are abstracted from percepts some contemporary philosophers that uh, still try to do that. On the other hand, might, one might uphold the incommensurability between non-propositional and propositional contents, claiming that the intuitive, con uh, uh, the intuitive and the explicit content are radically different sorts of things and that one cannot be derived from the other. An influential version of this view would hold that explicitly endorsed beliefs are not psychologically in psychological entities at all, but are rather irreducibly social linguistic entities that we attribute perhaps for their heuristic explanatory value. Or perhaps uh, ex explicitly endorsed contents derived from the social linguistic practice, think language game, of asserting and commanding. In any case, according to this view, according to, uh, although the intuitive contents influence the nature of our culturally elaborated, elaborated explicitly endorsed beliefs, the contents of explicitly endorsed beliefs yet have a large degree of independence from intuitive contents. This independence is due to the fact that the explicitly endorsed beliefs are justified not by any relationship to intuitive content, but rather through the language game of giving and asking for reasons. Such a view most naturally aligns with anti-representationalism that rejects the notion of a belief as something in the head and abjures any kind of mind-world mirroring relationship and uh, anti-foundationalism that denies that psychological entities such as intuitive contents play any kind of a, a epistemic role. Call this view the non-reductive connectionist view. The non-reductive view would seem, I think, a poor candidate for ac accommodating certain of the aforementioned metaphors. For example, the compatibility, reading off, matching, and not violating, me violating metaphors 
would uh, suggest some kind of rational or logical relationship between intuitive and explicit content. But since the non-reductive view holds that explicitly endorsed beliefs cannot provide rational support for intuitive contents, these metaphors would be misleading at best. Of all the metaphors, only Macaulay's rooted in, I think, resonant with metaphors would seem to be compatible with this view, which can freely admit that intuitive content is one of the causal constraints on explicit content. All the other metaphors, at least that I sampled up here um, today, uh, seem to imply too close of a relationship between intuitive and explicit content, at least for this view to be able to um, accommodate them. Um, whoops. Yeah, that was that. Um, <laughs> last part of the paper. Uh, <laughs> Clark and Barrett, 2010, 2011, have claimed a convergence between CSR's naturalness thesis and a Christian worldview, specifically what is often called reformed epistemology. All right. <clears throat> um, actually, if I do this right now, then I won't forget. Um, <laughs> I guess I shouldn't keep the bullet points. Um, so they've uh, claimed a, a, a convergence between CSR and reformed epistemology. Without wishing to dispute this claim per se, I would simply add that whether or not there is a convergence depends, among other things, on, particular, on the particular way in which we answer the, answer the interface question. More generally, the goodness of fit between CSR and one's religious commitments depends on what other theoretical and meta-theoretical commitments we make in our comprehensive worldview. Briefly and very roughly, reformed epistemology is a kind of externalist, reliabilist epistemology that denies that epistemic warrant for belief in God needs to be based on arguments or reasons that the individual him or herself possesses or that supervene on his or her endogenous cognitive processes. Rather, a belief in God is warranted according to the reformed epistemology if it is caused by a process that reliably produces true beliefs. Insofar as a belief in God is caused by a reliable process, we can call it properly basic, properly basic belief. So what can we say about the compatibility of the different uh, answers to the interface problem with reformed epistemology? It seems to me that classicism and reductive connectionism are compatible with reformed epistemology, since those two views imply that there is a close relationship between intuitive and explicit contents. And reformed epistemology needs the process that eventuates in the explicitly endorsed beliefs to be a reliable one. On the other hand, Non-reductive connectionism sees explicitly endorsed content, sorry, sees explicitly endorsed culturally elaborated contents as irreducibly social and linguistic and is heavily dependent on the linguistic practices in which we engage, even though partly constrained by the intuitive content. <clears throat> Philosophers who defend this type of view that I've called the non-reductive view um, often see intuitive content, i.e. what's in the head, as simply irrelevant to the contents, contents of our explicitly endorsed culturally elaborated beliefs. The reason the non-reductive view is incompatible with reformed epistemology is that the connection between intuitive content and the contents of our culturally elaborated, explicitly endorsed beliefs is too loose. According to the reformed epistemologist, intuitive contents must reliably cause true explicit contents. However, this is precisely what incommensurability blocks. According to the non-reductive uh, view, there is no reliable process by which particular kinds of intuitive contents issue in particular kinds of culturally elaborate, explicitly endorsed beliefs. This compatibility should not have been surprising since, given reformed epistemology's commitment to some version of realism, it was bound not to mesh well with the anti-representationalism non uh, of non-reductive connectionism. And that's it. Well, so, uh, Ben, this is kind of for you and kind of for Mark. How do you think, uh, say, a, a Catholic epistemology would fit in there that is, is less propositional and more, more involved in community and ritual? Um, I, my first impulse is to say, just to say I don't know. <laughs> um, less propositional and more... Um, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I see your point. I mean, I, I guess insofar as, as you know, the, the, you're acknowledging that, that epistemology is, is something about basically how well, 
your, your reasons stand up in a, in a practice of giving and asking for reasons. I mean, if, I don't, and I don't know that Catholic theology would assent to this. I'm inclined to think they wouldn't, but, um, but if they were, then I think uh, that would mesh better with the, what I'm calling the reductive or non-reductive view. Yeah, Myron. Uh, so um, different answers to the interface question, connectionism, uh, reductive and non-reductive version. Yeah. Uh, when you describe the reductive version, uh, you said that um, uh, non-propositional contents are said to support prop uh, the propositional contents of explicit uh, domain in a truth app way. But why, why in a truth app way? Couldn't, um, why not just some other virtue? I mean, if, if, the, if, if the question is, well, how does you know, our uh, intuitive, pre-reflective, you know, you know, mental content you know, support explicit propositional content, uh, why, why, does the, why does the end game have to be truth at this? Couldn't it just be some other uh, uh, virtue, like maybe explanatory coherence or um, you know, yeah. converging on some other goal that a specific module has with respect to belief formation? Yeah, I, I, suppo yeah. I, I think that it could, for the, even for the reductive view. Um, I guess what I, the way that I'm, I'm thinking, you know, which of these ways, um, these main kind of ways, and there are lots of different sub, I guess, views within those views that I'm mapping out. Um, but uh, I guess I, I was thinking that the reductive view can at least um, allow for a kind of a, a close relationship between those, what I'm calling intu the intuitive representational content, which is I'm viewing as kind of quasi-perceptual or imagistic or something. And then, you know, the, you know what it eventuates in. Or does true that just mean that from the subject's perspective, she thinks that the explicit content is a correct map of the world? Uh, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, um, yeah, I mean, there's, de there's definitely different language that, that you'd be used for classicism because you're going to be talking about, you know, as true to true versus the, the way I'm talking about the connectionism reductive view. It'd be um, whatever those intuitive things are, it's not, they're not properly said to be true, but they're so, they're, they, they are tightly connected to um, explicitly endorsed beliefs which we do say are true or false. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So, Thanks for your, your paper, that was really, really interesting. Oh, you kind of confused me a bit when we got to the end of the reformed epistemology application. So yeah. what wouldn't have confused me is if you'd made this move with a kind of classical evidentialist foundationalist <coughs> paradigm. You know, where there it really does seem like you need um, that's the first input to be something propositional and standing evidence relations. But, I'm, all, I'm still not quite seeing what, what that is supposed to be reformed this model, precisely because it is externalist. So why, why would a reformed epistemologist not just say, you know, we're planning to say, well, the design plan is such that certain imagistic lessons yep. um, have these uh, reliable causal relations, maybe with some basic religious yep. um, propositions, and um, and that transition is reliable, even though it's it's not something that's... And he could, and that's why I allowed that the reductive connectionist view is compatible with reformed epistemology, just not the non-reductive version. Right, the, the version where you can't, can't reduce yeah. the, the intuitive stuff to propositions and such, but I don't, I'm not seeing yet why on a very externalistic picture you can't just say, well, it's part of the design plan, that this stuff, even though it's not reducible to propositions, it can be costly links, reliably. What's, what, I guess, here's the thing, what's part of the design plan? Because I, I think so much of the focus in, in CSR is on, on the, what I'm calling in, in, intuitive content, right? I mean, that's, that's, it's like, that's where the, the you know, census divinitatis gets it. I mean, and right, because people, I mean, I think, it seems to me, my understanding plan, I mean, part of the whole kind of impetus of this is to, how can we have it such that normal, you know, not 
intellectually, you know, academically informed religious beliefs can be justified. And you know, you, you find yourself endorsing you find yourself ex endorsing these beliefs, but you don't necessarily, you know, know how. And they, yeah, the whole idea of the externalist reliableist is to is to allow those what you what it what you eventuate in the, the ones that are explicitly endorsed. I believe in you know God and to be able to be justified. But so, but how if the intuitive uh, it just seems to me that the intu the intuitive that the content must have a fairly tight connection to causal connection to to the contents of the expl explicitly endorsed beliefs, and and what I'm calling the non-reductive view kind of doesn't allow for that. The 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 connection is much less tight. Now, I don't think, I, I think this is probably okay for the reformed epistemologists because they're not going to be inclined to in, endorse that, what I'm calling a non-reductive view anyway, which, which is okay. I, I guess I, the interest I, I take in this is, is whether or not there, there's a compatibility here depends on other theoretical, meta-theoretical commitments, in particular maybe on things about cognitive architecture. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question. Probably not, but we can talk more about it. Yeah. This, this would be a great uh, a time for us to, um, to close the session. Uh, let us thank Matt. <laughs>